hope is something we all need, especially right now. Many of us have experienced feelings of depression, anxiety and despair, or are trying to support those we care about through the challenge of mental health issues. And sadly, many of us have experienced the loss of a loved one who have taken their own lives. My name is Cheryl and I work for Conway Libraries. My professional role and personal passion involves raising the profile and power of books and reading to support our mental health. One of the schemes public libraries deliver is Reading Well Books on Prescription, which was developed by clinical psychologist Professor Neil Frude and is managed by the Reading Agency. It is a medically endorsed scheme proven to be effective and beneficial in supporting those living with mental health issues. The range of self-help books on the list include those written by people who have lived through or are living with a mental health diagnosis. One of these books is by Matt Haig and it's called Reasons to Stay Alive. It's the true story of how Matt came through crisis and battled through a mental illness which almost destroyed him. It is a book which offers us a story of hope. We are going to give you a flavour of Matt's book and I'd like to thank the publishers Canongate and Alolva for giving permission for us to bring the book to you in this way. I'd also like to thank everyone who agreed to take part in this project by filming themselves reading extracts from this inspiring and informative book. We really do hope that by sharing Matt's book in this way, it may help us all to see or discover, even if things feel bleak or impossible, our own reasons to stay alive. How to be there for someone with depression or anxiety. Know that you are needed and appreciated, even it seems you are not. Listen, never say pull yourself together or cheer up, unless you're also going to provide detailed, foolproof instructions. Tough love doesn't work. Turns out that just good old love is enough. Appreciate that it's an illness. Things will be said that aren't meant. Educate yourself. Understand, above all, that what might seem easy to you, going to the shop for an instance, might be an impossible challenge for a depressive. Don't take anything personally, any more than you would take someone suffering with the flu or chronic fatigue syndrome or arthritis personally. None of this is your fault. Be patient. Understand it isn't always going to be easy. Depression ebbs and flows and moves up and down. Do not take one happy or bad moment as proof of recovery or relapse. Play the long game. Meet them where they are. Ask what you can do. The main thing you can do is just to be there. Relieve any work, life pressure. It is doable. Where possible, don't make the depressive feel weirder than they already feel. Three days on the sofa, haven't opened the curtains, crying over difficult decisions like which pair of socks to wear, so what? It's hard to explain depression to people who haven't suffered from it. It's like explaining life on earth to an alien. The reference points just aren't there. You have to resort to metaphors. You are trapped in a tunnel. You're at the bottom of the ocean. You are on fire. The main thing is the intensity of it. It does not fit within the normal spectrum of emotions. When you are in it, you are really in it. You can't step outside it without stepping outside of life because it is life. It is your life. Every single thing you experience is filtered through it. Consequently, it magnifies everything. At its most extreme, things that an everyday normal person would hardly notice have overwhelming effects. Depression for me wasn't a dulling, but a sharpening and intensifying as though I'd been living my life in a shell and now the shell wasn't there. What I didn't realise at the time was that this state of mind would end up having positive effects as well as negative effects. I'm not talking about all that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger stuff. No, that's simply not true. 
This isn't a question of strength. That shell might be protecting you, but it's also stopping you from feeling the force of the good stuff. Depression might be a hell of a price to pay for waking up to life. And while it is on top of you, it is one that could never seem worth paying. But it is quite therapeutic to know that pleasure doesn't just help compensate for pain. It can actually grow out of it. The thing I liked was the light. Light was everything. And so were books. I read and read and read with an intensity I'd never really known before. I'd always considered myself to be a person who liked books. But there is a difference between liking books and needing them. I needed them. They weren't a luxury during that time in my life. I think I read more in those six months than I had done during five years of university education. And I'd certainly fallen deeper into the world's conjured on the page. There is an idea that you either read to escape or you read to find yourself. I don't really see the difference. We find ourselves through the process of escaping. If there is a way out, a way that isn't death itself, then the exit route is through words. But rather than leave the mind entirely, words help us leave a mind and give us the building blocks to build another one. Similar, but better. Nearby to the old one, but with firmer foundations and very often a better view. Books were, in and of themselves, reasons to stay alive. Every book written is the product of a human mind in a particular state. Every time I read a great book, I felt I was reading a kind of map, a treasure map. And the treasure I was being directed to was in actual fact myself. One cliche attached to bookish people is that they are lonely. But for me, books were my way out of being lonely. If you are the type of person who thinks too much about stuff, then there is nothing lonelier in the world than being surrounded by a load of people on a different wavelength. In my deepest state of depression, I had felt stuck. I felt trapped in quicksand. Books were about movement. They were about quests and journeys, beginnings and middles and ends, even if not in that order. They were about new chapters and leaving old ones behind. Depression makes you feel alone. That's one of its main symptoms. So it helps to know you are not alone. Sometimes just looking at names of people who have suffered depression or are still suffering depression, but who clearly have or had other things that are great going on in their lives, gives a kind of comfort. So here is my list. Buzz Aldrin, Halle Berry, Russell Brand, Frank Bruno, Alistair Campbell. Jim Carrey, Winston Churchill, Carrie Fisher, Stephen Fry, Judy Garland. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, Isaac Newton, Al Pacino, Gwyneth Paltrow, Dolly Parton. Ben Stiller, Emma Thompson, Ruby Wax, Robbie Williams, Catherine Zeta-Jones. And what does this teach us? That depression can happen to Prime Ministers, playwrights, boxers, and the stars of hit Hollywood comedies. Fame and money do not immunise you from mental health problems. While we know it can happen to anyone, we can never be told too many times that it can actually happen to anyone. One of the things depression often does is make you feel guilt. Depression says, look at you with your nice life, with your nice boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, kids, dog, Twitter followers, your good job, your lack of physical health problems, your holiday to look forward to, your mortgage paid off, your non-divorce parents with your whatever, on and on and on. The world is designed to depress us. Happiness isn't very good for the economy. If we were happy with what we had, why would we need more? How do you sell an anti-aging moisturiser? You make someone worry about aging. How do you get them to buy insurance? By making them worry about everything. 
How do you get them to have plastic surgery? By highlighting their physical flaws. How do you get them to buy a new smartphone? By making them feel like they are being left behind. To be calm become, becomes a kind of revolutionary act. To be happy with your own non-upgraded existence. To be comfortable with our messy human selves would not be good for business. When we really look closely, the world of stuff and advertising is not really life. Life is the other stuff. Life is what is left behind when you take all of that away, or at least ignore it for a while. Once we begin to recover and to live again, we do so with new eyes. Things become clearer and we are aware of things we weren't aware of before. Anxiety accompanies half the cases of depression. Anxiety, which often bubbles up into panic, is a nightmare in fast forward. Anxiety, even more than depression, can be exacerbated by the way we live in the 21st century, by the things that surround us. Smartphones, advertising, Twitter followers, Facebook likes, Instagram, information overload, unanswered emails, dating apps, the changing climate, Photoshop cover models, Google-induced hypochondria, infinite choice, all that lacking we are made to feel, instant gratification, constant distraction, work, 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 24-hour everything. Anxiety, even more than depression, is very treatable. Ultimately, there remains no surefire cure. There are pills, but only a liar would say they work every time or that they are always an ideal solution. It is also rare that they cure someone without additional help. But when it comes to the anxiety side at least, there does seem to be one thing that works across the board to a greater or lesser degree, namely slowing down. Anxiety runs your mind at fast forward, takes away all the commas and full stops we need to make sense of ourselves. Here are some ways to add back that mental punctuation. Yoga, unlike other therapies, it treats the mind and the body as part of the same whole. Slow your breathing. In for five, out for five. It is very hard for panic to happen if your breathing is relaxed. So many anxiety symptoms are directly related to shallow breathing. Meditate. Just sit down for five minutes and try and think of a single calming thing or just focus on your breathing. Accept, don't fight things, feel them. Tension is about opposition. Relaxation is about letting go. Live in the present. Love is anxiety's greatest killer. Love is an attitude to life. It can save us.